Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Cedric, and uh, I'm here with you today because I built a build system. Yeah, I built a build system. I was young, I was experimenting. <laughs> I was trying to find a purpose in my life, so uh, I built a build system. All right, so that's me. Uh, I work at a Samsung, SmartThings, um, and yes, we are hiring, but um, I'll get back to this at the end of the presentation. Let's get started. Here is a, a lovely table of contents that I spent some time putting together to get everyone interested. I feel so I'll start with why, why? Why did I do that? And I'll follow up with what? Talk a bit more about what Cobalt is. And finally, the more technical piece, which I think I'll spend the most time on, uh, but how? How did all these things work? Part one. So the tool is called Cobalt. Uh, and what got me to uh, build this thing uh, when we have such an existing fine tools for us? Started with me, like most of the projects that I started working on, which is some dissatisfaction. Um, I'm not a hater. I don't hate things in general. I just like and dislike a few things. And after a point, you get to a point where you think, well, maybe I can do better. And instead of adjusting to these limitations that you feel the current tools have, you decide to have at it. You're going, to, you're going to sit down and try to see what would I build if I could do this from scratch. I actually liked uh, Maven and Gradle. I uh, still do. I still use them today. Um, I think they're both fine tools uh, from different generations. Gradle opened up a lot of the field in build tools, and I give a lot of credit for Gradle, including you know, leading to Cobalt, which is heavily inspired from Gradle. Uh, but I thought that both Gradle and Maven have a few uh, design limitations that uh, ended up being a little bit irritating to me uh, on the long run. Um, Maven, actually, I'm fine with the XML. The XML has always been very easy to write for me, uh, mostly because I always get a lot of help from the IDE because there are schemas for the XML, so I've never had to look for symbols to write. I get a lot of help there. My frustration with Maven was that I couldn't, it wasn't flexible enough, and I felt that I wanted to write code sometimes in my build files. So of course, when Gradle came out, this was you know, the, the heaven, the nirvana. Finally, our build files are executables. Uh, I can write code there. It's groovy, uh, which is fine language back then. I think we, we have a better language today. Uh, but at the time, it was really fun to write in. Uh, and then to me, Gradle came short on a few other different areas than Maven. Uh, it had the flexibility, but then suddenly that language and the dynamic language that supported it, Groovy, made it so that I never really felt comfortable writing uh, code inside these build files. I felt I always needed help. Uh, I always needed to reach out either for the documentation, which is huge, uh, but actually more often to Stack Overflow. I go to Stack Overflow, I try to Google a question that kind of looks like mine, I find a snippet of code, I copy paste it, I tweak it, and as soon as it works, I get the hell out of there because I still don't understand how Gradle works. And it's probably my own limitation because plenty of people are fine with it. Another aspect is that uh, I value my tools. Uh, I'm an engineer. I like to write code. But all the ecosystem, I think it's important for engineers to understand it, to master it, and to not be afraid to sometimes having to make changes that are not directly code. Uh, I feel I need to understand the build tool. I need to be able to modify it if I need to. I need to be able to read it and understand how it works. Um, and with both Maven and Gradle, I felt I never really gained the amount of understanding that I expected for myself. I thought also there might be some interesting new problems along the way, uh, trying to build a build tool. Uh, everybody has a vague idea of what we need to do, but who knows? You know, it's only when you actually start trying to implement problems that I thought I might find out that, well, you know, Gradle did a pretty good job after all. And, there are really hard problems, and I can come up with a better solution. But really, 
that's really all I wanted. I just wanted to write a lot of Kotlin. Um, I've been tracking Kotlin since you know, 2011, since the very early days. And until about two years, uh, two years ago, I think, is when I started working on Cobalt. I didn't really have a good project, a good you know, big piece of software that I could stick my teeth in and try to you know, improve my skills in terms of Kotlin, ecosystem, um, all the libraries, and all that. Um, all right, where are we back here? Uh, oh, yeah, OK. All right, part two, table of contents. What? What is Cobalt? Um, so just that, so that it can, uh, you have an idea of what it looks like, this is a build file. This is a, a full self-contained, uh, well, kind of. There is, I skipped the imports because they're boring, but there are a few imports at the top. But this is really the build file. Um, and interestingly, two years ago, when I sat down and I started designing uh, the build tool, I started thinking, what would be my ideal build file? I have this project, uh, jcommander, one of my open projects, and I thought, what would be for, moi, for me something that is intuitive? What would be the minimal build file? And this is pretty much what I came up with. Uh, two years ago, this is still, uh, two years later, this is still true. Um, so we have a version number declared in a val. We have a, a project. Uh, Note that the uh, name, group, artifact ID version are the Maven coordinates. Uh, this is something I realized I want my projects to have the Maven coordinates because like a lot of other people who do open source, we push things to just enter a Maven and all that. So I wanted this to be natively supported. We have dependencies for compiling or testing. Uh, we have assembly directives. Um, here it's saying that if you don't put it at all, we're just going to create a jar file. But here it's Maven jars, which means there are a few additional jar files that are going to be created, the API doc, the source, uh, the, the key, the signing, and all that. Uh, and finally, bin tray. Uh, that's another thing. Uh, Uploading to JSonter or Sonotype or Artifactory or wherever you upload, uh, something that I do all the time, it needs to be easy, it needs to have sensible defaults. I shouldn't need to write uh, publish-jcenter.gradle for 50 or 60 lines, which is what I have with Gradle, and then have that same file for Sonotype. Uh, so this, is, this was my goal. This is where I wanted to get. Of course, it has to be 100% in Kotlin. That was the point. Uh, and I also wanted the build file to be written in Kotlin. Uh, that was another of my pain points with Gradle. Uh, first of all, Groovy is dynamically typed. Uh, not really a fan of this, but I understand it bought us a lot of flexibility. But uh, a consequence of this is that things like auto-completion in uh, IDEs has never really worked very well for me, uh, for Gradle. Uh, whether it's Eclipse, whether it's IDEA, over the years, sometimes it works and then it stops working. Uh, and I understand it's a hard problem. Uh, dynamically typed languages are fickle beasts and a set of features which I'm going to go into in the, the following slides. So let's start with the most important one, the build file. Uh, what are the requirements? Um, so first of all, I want it to be valid Kotlin, uh, and not just because that was the point of the exercise to write Kotlin, but because I'm very lazy, and I wanted auto-completion to work automatically, and what best way to do this than letting you know, IntelliJ do all the hard work for me. So I thought if it's valid Kotlin code, I will get auto-completion for free. I wanted to use all the languages, uh, all the mechanisms of the language available and uh, use them for all the features that I need. And uh, I'll get a little bit more into details in a few slides when I talk about profiles to give you an example. Syntax needs to be intuitive. Uh, and of course, that's very subjective. And what I find intuitive, not everybody will. Uh, but I think we can kind of agree that there are ways that we can make things a little bit easier to read and more importantly, easier to write. Maven repo information, as I mentioned, I think it's part of our daily life now to push things to a Maven repos. So uh, make it easy, have sensible defaults, and uh, don't require to, you know, an extra plugin for this kind of thing. Uh, and also, again, credit to Gradle, uh, because uh, Cobalt is extremely inspired from Gradle. Uh, I, I stole all their good ideas, and uh, hopefully I invented a few new ones along the way. So this is the number one thing that fell from uh, having um, a build file that is valid Kotlin. You know, as soon as I had this, within the first few days, this is what you know, IntelliJ was giving me. I was writing my build file, and right away, you know, IntelliJ was perfectly happy to give me all the auto-completions, all of the tags that I can use, all the function calls, uh, and you know, whatever helper methods I can have. So uh, that was a validation right away, thinking, OK, this is useful. This is already more useful to me than uh, Gradle uh, completion has ever been in, uh, in the IDs that I use. Incremental tasks was also a, a big goal of mine, uh, one that took a little while to get right. Um, 
the, the idea here is that if you run a task twice in a row, the second, one, the second time it should be skipped. Um, this cannot be done all the time, but actually you can do it for a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of functions. And uh, if you build this inside the build tool, it becomes very possible to have very quick builds. Um, I'll get back to that in a little bit more detail because there are a few technical aspects here that are interesting. I'll just uh, point out that in this slide, we see two different tasks, and they both use incremental in different ways. The second one, assemble, is Cobalt that has decided that it doesn't need to do any assembling. In the first task, it invoked compile, and then it's the Kotlin compiler that itself detected that it needed to do a little less work than it thought. So this is important to have the collaboration of both Cobalt at a high level, which uh, orchestrates all the tasks, and make sure that only the ones that we need are run. And then individual tasks, when they are run, can also decide how effective they want to be. Parallel builds. Uh, that's also something that I thought was really silly that uh, we didn't have. Um, because as soon as uh, projects become complicated and they have multiple dependencies between each other, sometimes you cannot parallelize. But actually, very often, there are a lot of these tasks that you can run in parallel with uh, quite a lot of benefits. Short slide here again, because I'm going to uh, dive down a little bit more in details on uh, how this works and how to uh, make it uh, really, really successful. Profiles. Um, another important thing uh, in build files. Sometimes you want to run your builds, and you want to alter the way they work in slight and you know, all different ways. Sometimes it's very little detail. Sometimes the entire new phases of execution. So we need to have profiles. Maven has profile. Gradle has profile. I think you know, maybe Ant had profiles. Uh, so I wanted them in Cobalt, and then I'm thinking, how do we make that happen, but using just standard Kotlin features? So this is actually one of the first features that I looked at, and I, I started thinking uh, that, wow, there is really a good fit here between what I want to achieve and what Kotlin gives me. So here is how you do profiles in a Cobalt build file. Uh, you simply declare it as a val uh, at the top level. Uh, it's a Boolean. And then, since, again, this is just Kotlin code, you can use it anywhere an expression is needed. Uh, it's here, I decide to, uh, that the name of the project is going to be one way if the experimental is true and another name if it's not true. But really, you can put this kind of thing anywhere, uh, in your dependencies, in the middle of your code, in other tasks. Uh, so this is completely free. Again, I have nothing to do here. This is just the Kotlin compiler doing its job. And then I drive this from the command line, uh, and there are other mechanisms, but the easiest one is from the command line, and you can, uh, at runtime, override some of these Boolean variables. And here, by launching you know, dash dash profiles experimental, I'm telling Cobalt, please make this variable experimental true. And again, Kotlin compiler is going to do all its magic for me. It will select you know, the right branch and everything, and I have nothing to do. Uh, Cobalt's work here is just to do some surgery on the build file so that Kotlin see the, the, one, the version of the build file that we wanted to see. Project dependencies. Uh, this is also something that uh, Gradle does it, um, and it's OK. You, you can make it work. I've never been really satisfied with the way we do it, usually with a settings.gradle, and you include project there. Uh, and again, so I sat down and I thought, if I'm writing Kotlin code, how would I express that you know, project depends on previous projects? Um, and I came up with this syntax. Uh, not just me, actually. Somebody helped me came, come up with this syntax. The, the first version I had wasn't that clean, where Projects in a build file are really just variables, val, actually. And uh, you can specify dependencies by simply passing parameters to the project function. Again, it is a Kotlin function. So keep in mind, this is a DSL. This is a static safe builder. Um, so what I liked about this is that uh, I look at a build file, and I can see pretty much right away the dependencies. Uh, this is another thing that has always been a bit elusive for me in Gradle, is that if I want to get a, a sense of which projects depend on which projects, I need to go to build.gradle, need to go to settings.gradle, uh, and sometimes below in you know, folders. And trying to get a, a mental representation of the whole build system is not always easy. And I thought, at least you know, this, gives, this gives me a pretty good idea of you know, what depends on what. Um, and you can also just, for example, simple, simply do a grep on this build file, and you're going to see the list of projects with all the dependencies. Uh, and coming up with a, a graph for this is also pretty trivial. Plugins. Um, so build tools are actually pretty simple beasts overall. Uh, they're 
they don't need to have a lot of functionalities, and actually, uh, the less functionalities you put in them, the better you're off. But you need to offer some plugin architecture because people are going to want to use your build tool in ways that you haven't envisioned. So that was a big chunk of, of work and uh, of thought and, and a month of trying to get it right. Um, there are a few things that I knew I wanted, and there are a few things that I knew I wanted to uh, leave away, uh, leave out. Um, the Gradle plugin system is completely different. Uh, because it's based in Groovy, usually with the way you write plugins in Gradle is by modifying internal structures directly inside Gradle, uh, which Groovy you know, makes, uh, makes it possible and gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, I wasn't quite satisfied with this because, well, again, because it's dynamically typed, so it's always a bit difficult to know what types are available where. But also, I felt a bit uneasy at the idea that any plugin can modify the internal structures of the build tool and potentially you know, have effects that I've never really thought of. So instead, I took inspiration from Eclipse, an idea, and probably a bunch of other uh, extensible frameworks, uh, and I went the other way. Um, instead of you calling or modifying internal structures, when you run your build, the build is going to call you at define a point in the life cycles. Um, and these are defined through extension points. So Cobalt exposes a bunch of extension points telling you, I need a, a class path. Uh, I need a, a list of source files. I need uh, what happens after this phase. And then you just feed Cobalt what you want to do, and then Cobalt continues you know, along its way. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the Hollywood principle. You, know, you write your plugin. You don't call Cobalt. Cobalt calls into you at very specific times during the, the build cycle. Uh, the benefit of this is that we have a clean separation between the core and what the plugins do. And whenever the plugins return information, Cobalt is in charge of how it wants to manage this information. So what is private to Cobalt remains private. And again, there is nothing really new to this. This is exactly how Eclipse and IDEA works. And uh, we know, you know these extension points you know, are uh, very powerful and very flexible. Uh, the only downside is that your tool is only as powerful as the number of extension points that you expose. So it's very possible that one day someone is going to come to you and say, hey, I want to do this, but there are no extension points for this. And then you, know, you need to expose this as an extension point, as opposed to the Gradle approach, where you know, this conversation probably doesn't happen very often, because you can do pretty much anything you want with Gradle. A quick list of other features, and I really don't want to spend too much time on this, because I want to focus on the technical aspect. But just to give you an idea, uh, we have multiple testing frameworks. Uh, so building Maven repo uploads, as I mentioned, uh, templates to create projects from scratch. I want to create an Android project. I want to create a skeleton or you know, scaffolding or whatever you want to call it. ASCII art and animation. So that was actually also a design goal. Um, I spend a lot of time staring at these outputs, uh, seeing the build go by, or whether it's on Jenkins or Circle or whatever. You see these build outputs everywhere. Uh, and I thought I like them to be a bit more exciting. So early on, uh, I really tried to do my best to add some color, add some animation, make it a little bit sexy, try to have a, a clean output, uh, clean logging levels. Um, another beef that I have, I've never quite understood the logging levels of severe, warning, fail, and all that. I never really understand where they fit. So I mean, there's three logging levels, one, two, and three. The higher it is and the more verbose it's going to be. But at level one, the default, you're going to have, I think, a pretty clean output with nice graphics, nice animations. Um, Variants and flavors. So that was another also a goal that I had. Uh, for those of you who write Android, I'm guessing you know, quite, a lot, quite a few of you, but uh, maybe not everyone, um, the Android Gradle plugin has variants and flavors, which allow you to have different parts of your code base being bundled at the end uh, of the build system. And I thought, this is really a great feature. That's one that I've used a lot in Android. And there are a few times where I missed it when I was doing non-Android work. Think this is really something that should belong not just to Android, but in the build tool. This is useful. So variants and flavors are built you know, inside Cobalt. Uh, not just Android, they're available for any kind of build you want to do. Multi-language, uh, and by that I don't mean that you can build you know, Scala, Groovy, uh, Java, and Kotlin with Cobalt, but you can have also uh, all these languages intertwined in the same projects. And Cobalt will, know, Cobalt will know how to invoke the right compilers at the right time and how to package them uh, and in which order. Um, you can write tasks inside the build file. Now, sometimes you want a little bit more than can be offered, but you don't feel like you want to write a plugin, because writing a plugin is a bit more heavy work. So if you want to write a quick task in Kotlin again, uh, you can do this right there in the build file. Um, an example of this is generating version files, for example. Uh, in some of my projects, I generate a version.kt, which contains some you know, build information, version number, maybe a SHA, commit number, that kind of thing. This is done at each build takes you know, three lines of Kotlin, real Kotlin. You just call the API that you're used to in Java IO or files or whatever. 
uh, and you make that a real task that depends on other tasks, and it gets invoked automatically. Um, it self-updates. Uh, this is completely stolen from Gradle. Uh, I think I really love the way Gradle uh, can uh, self-update uh, by with the properties, with the wrapper, and all that. Uh, it's 90% is copied from Gradle, but there are a few things that COBOL does slightly differently. Um, and also another feature the, that uh, got me very excited and that I've always missed, uh, but I know it exists in certain form in all of these. Uh, you can also ask the build tool, OK, what are the new versions available? Take a look at my dependencies and tell me which ones are available. Don't make the change for me, because I still want to you know, do it manually or have some time to test it. But you can call you know, COBOL W check versions, and it's going to tell you, here are the new versions that I found from all your dependencies. Now it's up to you to uh, do whatever you want with them. All right, let's get a little bit more technical, but how? And we're going to start with the parallel builds. It's a very interesting uh, problem that led me down a, a path where you know, I ended up learning a lot of things. Here is an example project, uh, which I learned last night. I finally learned how it is pronounced. Uh, actually, do I still remember that? Uh, Kator or Gator. Uh, I think, I, I think well, yeah, I should have picked Gator, because Gator is a pretty cool name. But, so Kator. Uh, Kator is a web framework written in Kotlin uh, by Ilya and some, know, a bunch of other contributors. Uh, as of a few months ago, uh, that was the, uh, the dependencies in the project. Uh, I'm sure it's, uh, it's much more complicated now. But uh, this is pretty typical from a, a medium-sized project. Uh, it only gets more complicated after that. Uh, and these are all the modules or all the projects, uh, depending on what terms you want to use. So what we can see here is that core is the, the very beginning of the build. Uh, everything depends on it, so you cannot do anything until core has built. But once core has built, it looks like we can start building a few other things. So the question is, how do we build this in the most optimal way? How do we make sure that we really maximize uh, the way we're going to build this? It looks a bit daunting, but actually, the, uh, deconstructing the mechanism by which we get there is pretty straightforward. And uh, in order to do that, we need to have a quick you know, either refresher or new things about a topological sort. A topological sort is when you sort elements, but not all these elements can be compared with each other. If you have a set of integers, you can always compare any integer with any other integer. Here, for build tasks, Sometimes a task can be compared to another one, which means it needs to run before that other one. But there are other times where you compare two tasks, and it doesn't really matter. They don't depend on each other, so you can launch them at any time. So I capture this with this little example here. Uh, we have x and y, which are two tasks which have no dependence, which don't depend on anything. I call them free nodes, which means we can build them at any time. And then we have all these other mess there, of a2a1, b2b1, which have some dependencies with each other. How do we build this? So first, we identify the free nodes. Which are the ones that nobody depends on? Sorry, which are the ones that don't have any dependencies? Uh, so we find four of them, x and y, which are completely free, and a1 and a2, which also can be run right away. Uh, but all the others, none of them can be run just yet. We're going to need to wait a little bit. So first, we build these four. Doesn't matter in which ordering. And then, once they're done, or actually once a2 and a1 are done, we free B2 and B1, which are now ready to run. We build B2 and B1. And then, so once B2 has, is done, C2 cannot run just yet. But when B2 and B1 are done, then C2 is free, C1 is free, D is free. So at the bottom, here is the result of the topological sort. And you can notice I put in parentheses all the, uh, the ones that can be freely moved around. So this is a valid sort. But you can switch the first two, A1 and A2, and build in the order A1, A2, and the rest, and it's still valid. You're still going to be able to build. So now that we've determined this is the ordering that we can build these things in, how do we parallelize this? Because we can build A2, A1, XY in four different threads. And then, given certain conditions, we can build B2. And then, given certain conditions, we can build B1, and then, and so on. So how do we formalize this in order to make it really, really efficient? So the first version uh, was, you know, let's, not, let's make it easy, right? I mean, this multi-threading thing is tough. Uh, I don't want to work too hard, so we're just going to make it single-threaded. So we just pick that order, well, one order, A2, A1, X, and we build this in order. And it's going to work, but of course, it's going to take, well, the longest time it can possibly take. So not very satisfying. 
And then we can start introducing some multi-thread. So let's say we're going to have two different pools. And in one pool, we're going to put all the free nodes, because we know these can be run in parallel with each other without any restriction. But then we're going to have another you know, thread pool of one thread, which is going to take care of the dependencies. It's going to make sure that A2 runs first, and then B2 runs, and then C2 runs, and all that. So we're doing a little bit better, but really not that much, because all these graphs, the one that has all the arrows, they're still going to be essentially sequential. What we're gaining is that X and Y are going to be built in parallel. So it's going to be a little bit faster, but not that much faster. So we're still not maximizing what we can do here. So here is how we do it. Here is the solution. We identify all the free nodes, first of all. So we have A2, A1, X, Y. We launch them, separate threads, no problem. They don't depend on each other. But then each time one finishes, we recalculate that. So let's say x finishes first, and we ask, no, and now what are the free nodes? So here, x is not going to free anyone, because nobody depends on it. So we do nothing. Maybe y finishes, y doesn't free anyone, so we keep going. a2 finishes, and a2 is going to free b2, because b2 is the only one that depends on a2. So once a2 has finished, b2 becomes eligible to run. So now we know we can throw B2 in this big you know, thread pool, and we know it's safe. And we just iterate over this. And uh, this is completely deterministic, well, deterministic, not quite deterministic, but it's going to work because whenever we add pools, uh, whenever we add nodes to the thread pool, we know that nothing depends on it, so it is free to run. So the algorithm is really pretty simple, uh, as like everything else, the devil is in the details, of course, but. Um, Again, we just iterate, we just ask for the free nodes, and we launch them, and we just revisit this until we've run everything and we're out of free nodes. Uh, and this is a very generic algorithm. I actually used it for test engine before that to do multiple uh, uh, run tests in parallel. Um, and I do, you can really use it for anything that requires processing graph in parallel, even despite the dependencies. Uh, here is what it looks like. Um, so that, that should give you a better idea of you know, what actually works. So if you remember on the uh, diagram that I showed for KTOR, we had core at the very bottom, and everything depends on core. So let's say we're running with a, a thread pool of four threads, and we tell it, OK, so right now all I can give you is core. I cannot run anything yet. So first we're going to have core that is going to build on one thread, and the other three threads have nothing to do right now. And core finishes after 45 seconds. And now, by doing that, it frees up a bunch of other nodes. And so we can see that COBOL schedules KTOR locations for building, and then NETI, and then samples. And then also, it reuses the thread 39 to launch hosts. And now we're really maximizing the parallel. So then it's going to wait. We see that host is the first one to finish, zero seconds, so it was pretty quick. And so COBOL immediately schedules the next one, servlet. And we see samples also finishes pretty quickly. That uh, unblocks free marker and all that. And so you can really see the whole scheduling and how Cobalt went about to calculating all these things. And you can verify that it's correct, uh, first of all, by looking at the, just the letters, but also seeing that your build is successful. And also note that Cobalt will tell you how much time was saved, which is pretty easy to calculate, because I know exactly which task and how, much it, how long it takes. I just add that, and I know if I run sequentially, it would have taken that amount of time. But since a lot of them were run in parallel and overlapping, actually we ended up you know, cutting down the, uh, the build time by you know, quite a bit. I'm going to skip this because I'm, there is other things that I want to touch on, and I'm running a little bit behind. Incremental tasks. Um, so I touched a little bit on this, and this is, again, the, the design that I wanted to do. If a task is run twice in a row, it should be skipped the second time. It makes sense, but it's not as easy to do. So, the tasks are generic. So of course, a build tool, very often, we think of a build tool as taking files and input and producing files. And for you know, the most part, it's true. But our builds are a little bit more sophisticated these days. Uh, we have operations that don't really touch files. We have things, for example, that upload files to you know, an FTP server or something else. So it's not always file-based. I think if we base this on the input and the output of the files, we're going to not be able to create incremental tasks for tasks that are not file-based. So I wanted to have something that was a little bit more uh, generic and that doesn't even assume that the task work is based on the files in input and the files in output. So right now, uh, I came up with just using input and output hashes. A task 
tells Cobalt, this is the, the hash of all my inputs. So if, you, if it's working on files, it's just going to compute a hash of these files. And again, there are various ways you can do this. Uh, but the output is important also. Uh, a task can only be skipped if the input and output hashes are the same as the previous build. But if any of these has changed, then we know we need to rerun the task. So this has worked pretty well, uh, it's, and it's pretty easy to calculate hashes, um, and it's entirely up to the task to decide how they want to do it. All right, this is the big part that I wanted to get to. Um, this is Halloween, right? So I know it's going to sound a bit spooky, but uh, I, I promise you that to follow the slides uh, that are coming up, uh, you don't need to know anything about category theory. You don't need to know about programming language theory. Uh, we're just going to take a step-by-step -step, you know, trip around starting with a very simple problem and how we can come up with a solution which ends up being known as ad hoc polymorphism. I also promise I'm not going to use the Wikipedia definition of this because that will scare you to death. So we're going to start very simple. We have a JSON library, uh, and like all libraries, they come usually with two things. They're going to give you a bunch of types, interfaces or classes, and they're going to give you functions to manipulate these classes or these types. So uh, a JSON library will give you a JSON object and a bunch of functions to manipulate these JSON objects. How do we use this? Well, the, uh, the first idea is that uh, we use inheritance, and uh, a lot of frameworks do that. Uh, Android does that a lot. Um, I'm kind of partially responsible for this. Uh, but there is a lot of inheritance in Android and a bunch of other places where they tell you, if you want to use these objects or these interfaces, you, ha you need to have your class extend from it. Um, in this example, let's say I want to uh, manipulate you know, JSON versions of my class account. All right, I'm going to extend JSON objects. I'm going to implement whatever functions that interface mandates, and then I'll be able to use the JSON library and pass my account objects to the JSON library. It's not great. Uh, first of all, it forces inheritance. And uh, as you know, in Java and Kotlin, we only have one shot at that for implementations. So not very happy when a library forces me to say, well, you're going to have to extend our concrete class. And then, well, I'm, if you're already extending one of your own classes, then you're going to have to muck around with your own hierarchy and uh, adapt to me. I don't think it's a very friendly way of building libraries. Another problem, more on the, uh, the design standpoint, is that, no, my account is tied to JSON. And uh, I don't really care about this. Uh, this is an account. It has you know, financial information. Uh, maybe one day I will want XML. Maybe one day I'll want something else. Uh, and there might be other things. Maybe I'm going to use another library. And so next thing I know, my account will be a JSON object. It will be serializable. It will be able to be saved to a database. Uh, this leads to a you know, very, very tight coupling with a lot of concerns that are completely unrelated with each other. And finally, the, the nail in the coffin of this approach, I mean, so far it's fine if account is mine. It's the, my source file, it's my team, all right, fine, I'll make it extend what I need. But what if that class is coming from another library or a team that you, know, you don't have access to? You cannot make that class implement JSON objects. Uh, and even if you could try to convince the people who own it, they might tell you, no, this is not good. So this is not great. So we have better ways. Thanks to Kotlin, we can do a little bit better with extension functions. So the idea is now this is the same. We just you now implement to JSON, and um, we create a JSON object from this, and this is defined outside of the account class. So we solve the problem of not having access to the source, which is good. Now I can do this to any type, even if I don't own it. The downside now is that my uh, account object is no longer a JSON object. So if I want to use this JSON library, if I want to invoke all these functions that expect a JSON object, I'm going to in have to invoke that function explicitly. Not a huge deal. Uh, it's, it's actually part of the, uh, the design philosophy for Kotlin to make things more explicit. So this is not bad code to me. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with this. Uh, but we can do a little bit better, uh, despite all the advantages that it has. This is what I would call poor man ad hoc polymorphism, uh, in the sense that we have a little bit of the polymorphism part, and by polymorphism means we're changing objects from a certain shape to another shape. So here we're turning an account into JSON. Um, and it's ad hoc because we only do this when we need to, and when we don't need to, the account object is an account object. It's not a JSON object. Let's take a look at another example, a persistence. So you have a, a class person and you want to save it to a database. Here is the first version you might be tempted to write. Persist, takes a person, 
call save, uh, and we need an ID which is defined on person. Uh, so this is not great because again, uh, this function is uh, tightly coupled to a person. It can only persist a person. If you want to persist an account, we're going to write a second one. We're going to copy paste. Uh, I'll leave that to good developers. We know better. So instead, uh, when we start wanting to uh, persist more things, we're going to identify what do all these things have in common? What do I need to persist them? So we find out, well, they all have an ID field. So all right, so I'm going to extract an interface called has ID, and I'm going to have all my objects implement that interface. And now, the signature of persist is you know, a little bit cleaner. Now, all it needs is objects that conform to the interface has ID. It's no longer account, no longer person. We've gained uh, in generosity. This is a bit cleaner. But here is where we can do even better. The, the problem that we had with this version is a bit the same that we had before, which is uh, these objects need to confirm to that type has ID. And we've identified this is not great, because again, we, maybe we can't do that. Maybe we can't have all these objects implement the interface. So instead, we're going to switch things around. Instead of requiring persist to receive an object that follows a certain contract, a certain interface, we're going to pass to persist a way to obtain what it needs. So take a look at the signature here. Persist now is generic. It takes an object of type T, and it takes a lambda. And that lambda takes a type T and gives me the ID that I need. The implementation is, you know, again, straightforward. We just save and we call the lambda. Persisting, now calling this, has become a, a little bit more verbose, admittedly. Uh, but um, it's still pretty easy to follow. So let's say we want to uh, uh, persist a person. And we own person, so we made it implement the interface has ID. So that lambda is pretty straightforward to write. We just take a person and return person.id. What if I want to persist account, and account comes from a library that I don't have access to? It doesn't implement has ID. So instead, I just need to have a way to create an ID from an account, and that can be my own function or a function that comes from somewhere else. And I can pass it, and persist won't care. It will do the exact same job. But now I've been able to completely separate all my domains without polluting anything. So again, let's take a closer look here, because uh, this is really the core of ad hoc polymorphism. This is really what we are trying to do when we're making this move. So first of all, it's completely detached from your classes. What we wrote here has not impacted account, has not impacted person. It's completely separate. Persist itself has no types. It's completely generic. It takes a type T, and it knows nothing about it. It will work on any types. The only constraint now has been shifted to you. We are telling you, you still need somehow to conform to you know, being able to give an idea. But we're not doing it through the type. We're doing it through a function. And this shift from depending on a type to depending on a function is where we're moving toward more functional programming. This is where we start entering this idea that we can escape some of the constraints that types put on us. But we remain statically typed. We're not getting rid of types. We're not you know, having any or object or anything like that. This is fully statically typed. But the difference is that we got rid of nominal types, and now we have functions. This function is an adapter. You've probably you know, heard that term before in the design patterns. That was documented 20 years ago. This is not really new. Uh, and this is the mechanism that we're using here to emulate ad hoc polymorphism in Kotlin. Uh, languages that support this natively uh, would do that for you. The Haskell has type classes, and, and they do all these things automatically. We don't have this. There are a few limitations in Kotlin that prevent us to go to that distance. But with this kind of approach, we can actually get you know, a pretty long way toward being able to separate all our concerns and being able to use function to bridge those gaps. So the bottom line here is that we depend less on types, and we depend more on functions. And that buys us flexibility. It's not a silver bullet. There are times where the type or nominal typing approach works really well. But in those times where you find yourself having to make a type that you don't control conform to an interface and you're stuck, this is how you can do it. And this is how you can design your API. So this is really ad hoc polymorphism. It's just polymorphism that you can use whenever you need it, but you don't have any constraint, and it's not always you know, necessary to have it. 
In a nutshell, we move away from the types and we put emphasis on functions. For Kotlin, this is a step forward type classes. Another thing that uh, is you know, available in languages like Haskell and uh, Scala, uh, which are not available in Kotlin. However, uh, there are a few discussions around that topic. And if you're curious to learn a little bit more, uh, these past few weeks, there have been some interesting progress on, uh, on the specific keep, number 87, called type classes as extensions in Kotlin. Uh, there have been a few proposals to go toward that direction. So far, none has really taken off. But this one has, you know, seems to be moving in the right direction. So uh, there are discussions around this which would provide us ad hoc polymorphism and type classes in Kotlin. This is still a long way out, but so far the discussions are uh, very interesting and, uh, and going in the right direction. OK, so uh, I guess I'm still OK on time. So too bad I skipped the other topic, but I'm not going to go over it. I'm um, just going to wrap up. Uh, this is Cobalt, if you want to take a look. Uh, this is the documentation. This is the GitHub repo. Everything is public. Everything is open source. Um, welcome to take a look. Uh, you don't have to use Cobalt, but I hope there are a few ideas in there that will make you look at maybe Gradle build files or whatever other build file you use or build system and make you think, well, maybe we can improve that. You know, if there are a few ideas that you like here that you think you know, could benefit from Gradle, by all means, go ahead and file features. Uh, have this transfer of knowledge you know, to lift us all up so that we can all benefit from it. Uh, the, a plug, a quick plug. So yeah, uh, I work at Samsung Smart Things. We're uh, a company that is uh, part of Samsung, but we're very independent from Samsung, and we're hiring Kotlin Android developers. We're in Mountain View, so if you're curious about the Internet of Things, if you're curious about all these devices that surround us in the home or outside home, and you want to have a, a say in this, please and drop me an email. Be happy to talk to you. And with that, um, we have five minutes for uh, questions. So um, dependency, downloading, test running, and parallel builds, how do they all interact? Uh, well, they seem pretty separate, right? I mean, uh, dependency downloading, I'm, um, I'm using, I'm, I started by reinventing this myself until I realized, you know, the Maven repo system is, is, is great. I love it. Uh, but it's complex and has a lot of edge cases. So instead, we're using uh, Ether, which is the library that was published by Eclipse. Uh, Eclipse. Uh, which you know, everybody, every build tool uses, so do the same thing. So for this, for dependency resolution, the version ranges, all these extra things, I completely delegate this to uh, Ether. But, but two, <coughs> two modules might want uh, a same dependency. One starts downloading it, the other one waits for it, or? Oh, uh, so yes, they, they do this, right. yeah. They do, they do a parallel downloading also. And test running, if, to, um, <coughs> if I'm running tests against a database, can I say, don't do that? Or? If you're using TestNG, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you're using other test systems, I don't think there, a lot of them do uh, parallel runs for tests. Uh, there are a few extensions to JUnit to do that, uh, but they're not part of the core. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you have any plans uh, to use coroutines Instance of threats? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been playing with coroutines you know, since day one. Um, so far, there is not that much asynchronism. Uh, I use uh, retrofit in places like this where there is callback and there would be some gain for coroutines. Uh, but no, right now there is no coroutine, uh, not because I don't like them, because I think they're really, really interesting and, and very well done, just because I haven't really found a, a good place where they would fit. But I can tell you, every time I come across an API that has you know, async callbacks or things like that, now my, my immediate reflex is, sir, uh, I don't want to do that. I'm going to write a coroutine way and see if I like it. And most likely, I will, and I'll keep it. But my default is to consider coroutines first, yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, um, the actual execution when you run the command line tool. Um, uh, like, so the, like you're defining these build uh, files in Kotlin. Um, are, you, are you in? actually compiling them and then uh, using that to execute? or <laughs> I, I'm happy to go into the details, maybe offline. But yes, that's, that's what I do, eventually. There are two phases. Uh, and I, I don't want to go too deep, but uh, I don't use Kotlin scripting. I've been playing with it. Uh, and it would be a good fit, but not good enough. So I'm still using the compiler, which generates class files. A mm. uh, lot of interesting details, but I thought it would be a bit too detailed for, you know, to explain to people, a bit too under the hood. Uh, but I'm happy to explain to you how everything works under the cover. All right, thanks. 
Um, so, are you done with Cobalt? Are you <laughs> still working on it? Is something that you're? I have two questions. That's the first one that I have for you. Is is it like in a state that you consider it done, or are you continuing to develop on it and continue to add things to it? Yeah, so, so it's done given the initial design goals that I set for myself. Uh, and uh, that, I crossed that you know, threshold about three, four months ago. I said, all right, you know, I've put in everything that I wanted now. Now I'm just going to put it out there and see if people like it, see if people use it. Uh, if there's traction, great, then I'm happy to you know, work again on it. But from the experiment standpoint, my experiment and my play with it is done. But again, if there's interest and people are happy to pick it up and start using it, um, I'll be happy to get back to it. And, uh, I'm still working on test ng, you know, 14 years later, uh, just because people keep using it. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to get back into that if needed. But right now, you know, Gradle is the standard, and I think it's been a great stride in the right direction. Kotlin is the uh, uh, supported now and probably going to become the standard for build files. And I know the, the Gradle team is tireless and improving the tools and all that. So this is the standard. Cobalt is a, a fun experiment, which I think has a few interesting ideas. But if it stops there, that's fine by me. Um, the other question that I had for you was, uh, you have the variable there, you de de declare it a variable, then you add a profile, and then it dynamically rewrites the Boolean. To tr it, that seemed like it wasn't using def um, uh, the by syntax. So are you like, dynamically rewriting bytecode after you compile it in order to like, undeclare a variable that's <laughs> defined okay, another, fault? OK, another under the cover thing. Uh, I, I rewrite the source, actually. Ah, OK. But I, I've played with delegates for, for a little while using by and all that. It didn't, wasn't quite exactly where I wanted it, so right now I'm still sticking to the, the source modification. Right. But uh, it's an interesting point that you would pick up on that because it, it looks simple. The slide is awesome because it's just a few lines. But when I think about everything that's underneath and it took me to get it right, it was, yeah. it was painful. Hi, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, is there a way to import COBOL, you know, um, build files into IntelliJ, you know, and have it build all of the, create all of the IML files and, and well, er everything that... Yes, actually, I completely forgot to mention that. Uh, maybe I did. Uh, there is a, a COBOL uh, IntelliJ plugin. Oh. It's exactly the same as Gradle. It will cool. detect, you know, COBOL files, it will build, it will create your dependency in the project structure, dependencies, and all that. So uh, there is a full ID plugin, which is actually developed by uh, someone whose brother is on the JetBrains team. But that, that guy himself is not on JetBrains. But, <laughs> and he's been doing a fantastic job. The, the plugin works really well. So yes, it's cool. completely integrated with IntelliJ. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>